But by way of an introduction for tonight's topic, about 15 uh, years ago, uh, back when I lived uh, in uh, London in the UK, I had the, my first opportunity to visit a place uh, in London that many of you may have heard of. It's world famous. And its name is Speaker's Corner. Some of you may have heard of Speaker's Corner. It's known as the kind of world center of free speech. It's uh, part of one of our big parks in London, where on a Sunday afternoon, thousands of people gather to hear speakers. Anyone can speak at Speaker's Corner. You can stand on a, on a soapbox or some kind of other platform. Someone of my height prefers a stepladder. And you can talk about anything. And one of my friends who'd been frequenting Speaker's Corner said to me, Andy, why don't you come to Speaker's Corner and try your hand at preaching on the street? It's really easy. There was something wrong with those two words that I didn't spot at the time. I perhaps should have done. Um, because when I turned up a Speaker's Corner and ascended my ladder, there were a crowd of several hundred who, uh, who gathered, obviously drawn by my attractive disposition and uh, athletic physique. And what I discovered was that in the crowd that day, uh, there were many, many people who had spent years practicing taking Christians to pieces. And uh, they heckled and they heckled well. And to say that I did badly that day is to flirt dangerously with understatement. Um, there were questions to my Christian faith, there were objections from Muslims and atheists and Marxists and you name it. And I couldn't answer a single one of them. And I remember getting down from that stepladder that afternoon in London, thinking to myself, well now I have a problem. Either I have to conclude that the things I thought I believed were not true, or I need to be willing to put them to the test and really investigate things for the first time and see whether the Christian faith that I thought I believed so dearly is actually true. And that led to a journey that eventually led to studying philosophy and doing a PhD, uh, eventually in Islam, actually of all things, uh, so I could understand my Christian faith better. And I came to the conclusion that things I did hold dear are true, but there was a long journey. And this is the thing about tonight, really, and the penning tonight. It's very easy to believe things and not investigate them. It's very easy to make assertions about things, about what you believe or what other people don't believe, without actually investigating the facts. And one of the things I really appreciate about Nabil's uh, story, and you're going to hear a lot about Nabil's story and journey this evening, is he is somebody who really has built his life on investigating the evidence and seeing where it leads. So I don't want to tell you too much about his story because he's going to share much of it as he speaks. Uh, but he is somebody who is committed to following the evidence where it leads. And for Nabil, following the evidence, investigating the claims of Christianity and of Jesus, led him to somewhere where, when he first set out, he could never have imagined where he would end up. So Nabil Qureshi, who will come and speak in a moment, is uh, it's my privilege to introduce you to him this evening. He's a friend, uh, he's a colleague at the organization I uh, work for, he's a best-selling uh, author, his book uh, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus uh, has, uh, has become a bestseller. In fact, he's just become a New York Times best-selling author. Over dinner, he said to me, should I tell people that? And he was very humble, so I told, I thought I told him that I would uh, tell you that if he didn't. So he's just hit the NYT bestseller list uh, for his book. It's an amazing uh, story. You're going to enjoy this evening tremendously. He's also a husband and a father, and uh, just become a father, in fact, of a beautiful little girl called Aya. So if he looks a little bit tired and jet-lagged this evening, it's not the transatlantic flight, it's the midnight diaper changes. Um, but you're going to enjoy uh, listening to him. So please give a big Toronto uh, welcome to Dr. Nicole. So just so you know, Andy is both a good friend uh, and also the uh, lead for the Canada team. Uh, between us, we make up the long and short of the ministry. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> I'm really thankful to be here. Um, I'm thankful to be here, not there. <laughs> um, so, I've been uh, coming to Toronto quite frequently, actually, for the past uh, 25 years. Um, my family moved to Connecticut uh, in 1990, and I had an aunt who lived in Kitchener, uh, which is not far from here. I'm sorry, in Cambridge, uh, not far from Kitchener. Um, and she has lived there ever since. So we came to visit her quite regularly at that time. Then I had another aunt who moved to Toronto uh, in the mid-90s. And so we were here every single summer. So Toronto's kind of close to my heart. I was just checking the scores. Jays beat the Yankees. Yeah. 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 Cool. And now the 
they're playing the second game and they're up again. So that's pretty amazing. Um, it's good to it's good to see Toronto getting some love and beating down the Yankees. Everyone likes it when the Yankees are beat down. Okay, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, some of you uh, tried to come up and talk to me uh, before we started. Um, I, I really apologize if it looked like uh, we were trying to push you aside. Um, my throat has actually been hurting. The coffee was not for the caffeine. It's because of my throat. I want to make sure I get through this. So there was one guy who came up and said, can I take your picture? And he looked really happy. And then I said, uh, I have to go. And he looked really sad. So uh, wherever you are, please come up first after this session is done. And we'll make sure to get that picture. Um, and what I want to do before we start is emphasize just how important what we're going to talk about tonight is. I think the question of God's existence is single-handedly the most important issue we can ever ask ourselves. Uh, and uh, one of the great benefits of studying at Oxford University, which is where I am now, is uh, when we have dinner and when we meet with people, we meet with people from various different fields. So most of the people I meet with at Oxford when I'm not actually studying are not theologians. And so I get to sit down with people and ask them questions like, why are you doing what you're doing? And some of them might be working on uh, computers and uh, quantum optics, or some of them might be doing mathematics. And generally speaking, I don't know about you, but at least the people I run into at my university at, at Oxford, they might be super intelligent, they might have all their ducks in a row as far as what they're doing with life, but they have certain questions that are simply unanswered. Like, why am I really here? I'm, I'm running the, the race, I'm, I'm doing my best so I can uh, provide for myself and later for a family, hopefully if I have one. Uh, but why am I doing it? What's the point to all this? And, and what, what exactly should I even have a family? Should I go down that route? What's the purpose in running through this rat race? Is there any purpose? Or should I buck the whole system and do my own thing? What's that about? One thing that I see in common amongst most people that I talk to is that a lot of people in, in school now or in universities now, they have a desire to help. A lot of people want to go and help build wells or they want to do social justice or they want to help women who are caught in the sex trafficking industry. Those kinds of things, we in our generation, I, I love the fact about our generation that we want to go and we want to help with those things. But what I find is most people who do that are doing that so that they can infuse some meaning into their life. Because otherwise, they just have none. And is that really the basis upon which we want to live a life of altruism, just so we can find some meaning for ourselves? So the question of whether God exists impacts this issue of meaning. Because if God, just work with me for a second, I know many of you here might not actually be theists, and that's totally fine. At the end of the day, if you want to ask questions, please do. But if God does not exist, that has radical implications for the way we see the world, the way we see ourselves. Quite frankly, the way I was taught when I was going through my undergraduate studies and then my medical school studies, I went to medical school, I graduated from medical school, got my MD before I moved into the field of theology. What I was taught repeatedly throughout all of that was kind of the, what's called the uh, neutral position on the start of life, on evolution. Uh, and I'm not here to say that we should teach other theories in school, that's not my point. But from what was being taught in our universities, what people were walking away with is that this universe came into existence by a big bang. I'm not arguing against that, by the way. I'm just saying this is what we were taught. The universe came into existence by a big bang, and then things happened to spin and spiral in such a way that this galaxy was made, and then that galaxy happened to spin in such a way that this solar system was made, and this solar system happened to spin in such a way that the Earth was made, and the Earth happened to spin such that life somehow formed out of the ocean. We don't know how, and that life then evolved and became us. What does that tell you about yourself? That you're a cosmic byproduct. That you are random chance. That you are here on accident. That's the message that we're teaching, not just the normal person who wants to go and make uh, you know, whatever industry, even medical doctors who are taking care of other people are essentially being taught those people are accidental lumps of carbon. Take care of them. Really? That has an impact on how we see ourselves and how we see other people. Now, again, I haven't proved any of this. I'm just juxtaposing it so you can understand how important this question is. Let's say that instead of that model, where you just happen to be born, 
and you happen to be here, let's say there's a model in which there's a creator who said, I want Sean, or I want Catherine, or I want whoever. I want this person to be in Toronto in 2015. Because this person has skills and gifts and passions. This person can change the world from Toronto. So I'm going to put them here. Which of those two models will motivate you? Which of those two models can you find purpose? I'm telling you, this question of whether God exists changes virtually everything about the way we see ourselves and the way we see other people. So I'm really glad you're here tonight. Because it's not just a matter of whether God exists. That is an important question, one that I'm not actually going to be touching on directly during my talk. Indirectly, yes, and you can feel free to ask it during the Q&A. But the next question becomes, who is that God? Because who that God is matters as well. And I, for one, am tired of the rhetoric which says that all religions are essentially the same. I'm tired of the rhetoric which says that all gods are essentially the same, or the Christian God and the Muslim God are essentially the same. I can tell you what, if that had been the case, I would have saved myself a ton of heartache by staying Muslim. And you go, go tell my parents that Nabil still worships the same God, we'll see what they say. Because they don't think so. And virtually none of the Muslim community I was a part of think so either. It's kind of condescending to the people within these religious traditions to say, oh, you just worship the same God. They're very different. Ask a Muslim if they, if they worship the Trinity. They will tell you, absolutely not, that's blasphemy. So let's unpack some of these things. Let's walk carefully, because these questions actually matter. If you're here as an uh, atheist today, you're fine. Don't, don't take part. But if you're here as a theist, please join me in prayer. Um, this will be a, a neutral prayer. Um, so if you can just join me, and we can ask God to be a part of this. God, we thank you for creating the universe. We thank you for giving us minds that are not satisfied with superficial knowledge, but that you've given us minds to dig, and then you've given us tools to acquire truth by your grace. And so, God, I ask you, please, to be with us now, because I don't want to say anything false. And I want people to be able to open up their hearts and just be vulnerable and honest and receive. And, and not from me, either, because I have nothing to give, but from you, God. So please be present as we search for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So let me tell you how it started for me. Um, when I was uh, at the university, I was in an Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, I joined the public speaking and debate team. First thing I did out of the blocks, my freshman year of college, joined the public speaking and debate team. The first tournament we go on, I see somebody uh, who's a pretty cool guy. Um, he's got some, a good set of morals. Uh, most of the team wanted to go out and, and party at that time. My mom had said, absolutely not. You don't go out and hang out with girls. You don't go and get drunk. You don't do any of that. You're a good Muslim boy. So you can't do that. So I'm, you know, I'm at this hotel, and I'm like, all right, you guys all go out partying. You do your thing. I'm going to stay back. There was one other guy who stayed back. And we immediately became friends because he didn't want to partake in that either. We decided to, to share the room together for the night. We all had to partner up, so the two of us partnered up. And what do I see him do but pull out a Bible? Now, you have to understand, I had been taught my whole entire life that the Bible was an antiquated document that simply could not be trusted, that people had found all kinds of contradictions in the Bible, that it had been changed, its transmission was not reliable. That's what had been drilled into my head from childhood. So I turned to my friend David, and David, I look at him and I said, David, do you realize that book you're reading is not trustworthy? And he looks up at me and he slowly closes the book and says, go on. <laughs> Which should have been a sign for me that the conversation wasn't going to go my way. But I just went ahead blindly into that. And I said, David, you realize that the Bible was written in Aramaic. At least the parts that talk about Jesus, Jesus' words were in Aramaic. We know Jesus spoke Aramaic. But when the Bible was actually written, it was written in Greek. So though Jesus spoke Aramaic, we have it written in Greek. Are you telling me nothing was lost in translation there? And then the Greek Bible spent over a thousand years in Latin before it came into English through German. So you got a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. Are you telling me nothing was lost in translation? Come on, David. 
And then David said to me, Nabil, just a little while ago, I heard you speaking to your mom on the phone. Did you speak in English? I said, no. And he said, when I asked you what you talked about with your mom, you told me in English. Did you give me a bad translation? No. <laughs> he says, Nabil, when we take writings and messages from one language, if somebody is bilingual, they can accurately translate that message into another language. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They spoke to Jesus and they wrote the Bible in Greek. And then when we have that Greek New Testament, then gets translated into Latin. And then from that Latin, we have the English, these other translations. It all comes back to the Greek. And we have of that Greek in our possession over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. And I said, whoa, time out. You're telling me we have 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament? And he says, yes, Nabil, from ancient times, before there was a printing press. And then he starts unpacking with me the, the history of the transmission of the Bible. Now we started getting into details. Because before, everything I had been taught was basically just rhetoric. It was, Nabil, believe this about the Bible. Now we started digging. Now we started looking at the evidence. We started looking at the primary sources. And it turns out, I don't know if you know this, but it turns out that we have in our possession a whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation from 300 to 358. The whole thing. Now, I had heard my whole life that the Bible had been changed over a thousand plus years. But that's simply not possible if we have one that was written less than 300 years after Jesus' death. Are you with me? So we've got to calibrate these arguments to understand what's being said. So now I started engaging in these conversations with my friend David. Essentially, what I was trying to do was convert him to Islam. And he was trying to convert me to Christianity. Um, and we just went at it. And we realized that we both had a common passion for God. We realized that we both had a common passion for the truth. So what we started doing, David was uh, studying biology. I was doing pre-med. We started signing up for classes together so we could sit in the back of the lecture halls and argue. <laughs> Like if David and I had been here, we would be sitting way in the back and just going at it the whole time. Uh, we signed up for tons of classes. My, David would come to, to my house. My mom would cook him food, biryani, gorma, naan, and roti, and everything. And he just loved it. I'd go to his dad's house, and he would give me beef jerky. <laughs> so, whatever, right? So we're friends. And as friends, and here's the thing, I've seen a lot of people talk about religion amongst each other, trying to convert each other, who are not friends. And let me tell you this, if you're talking about deeply held beliefs with someone who's not your friend, that's not going to go well. Because you're going to think they're attacking you. But see, that's not what tonight's about, and that's not what our conversation was about between me and David. We weren't attacking each other, we were trying to build each other up. So our conversations took off from that point. We ended up spending four years talking about Islam and Christianity. Our conversations lasted until I came into medical school. What I noticed very quickly was that I had started discussing things from various angles and perspectives. There's lots of issues to talk about when you're talking about religion. You can talk about things like Evolution, that's related to both Islam and Christianity. You can talk about things like uh, the virgin birth. You know, both Islam and Christianity believe in the virgin birth. So you can start talking about those things, but I quickly realized that there's some central issues that you have to discuss. What is the core of the Christian message? You know, there's different kinds of Christianity too, right? There's major branches. There's the Orthodox branch of Christianity, the Catholic, there's the Protestant, and within those different branches, there are many, many, many different denominations. What is Christianity? What is the core? For those of you who are taking notes, I believe that the core is found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 of the Bible. This is where we see it in one place. Now hear me out for a second. I know some of you are thinking, Nabil, I don't believe in the Bible. That's fine. You don't have to believe that it's reliable to, to at least see the core of the Christian faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We've got three things going on here. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, okay, what kind of Lord? If you go a few verses down to Romans 10, 13, you'll see that the Lord we're talking about is God himself. So you have to believe Jesus is God. 
And you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of mankind. And then number three, you have to believe that he rose from the dead. These are the three core claims of Christianity. And by the way, what is all this showing? The message of Christianity. This is really important to get because when I was a Muslim for the first few years of discussing this with David, I didn't quite understand this. There are four books called the Gospels, but the Christian message itself is called the Gospel. There's, so there's, some, there's a message that's given the name the Gospel. What is that message? That message is that we have been alienated from God by rejecting Him. We use the word sin traditionally, but a lot of people don't like that word these days, so let's translate that. By rejecting God, by intentionally rejecting God, we are saying to the author of life, I don't want you. And then at the end of our lives, God says, fine, I'll give you what you chose. You don't want me. You don't want the source of life. You don't want the source of happiness. You don't want the source of joy, of peace. You chose to reject me. Fine. Have what you chose. The absolute opposite of life. The absolute opposite of joy. The absolute opposite of peace. We call that hell. The good news, the gospel message, is that God is willing to enter into this world and take our punishment upon himself. So that's the component where we say that Jesus dies on the cross. But he claimed to be God. The second part, this isn't some random person. This isn't someone appointed by God. God didn't send someone to do his dirty work for him. God himself entered into this world. Only he has the ability to forgive us of our sins. But to prove that he was God, he then rose from the dead. Not only that, but to tell us that we have a hope when our life is over, of an afterlife. He rose from the dead. Now that's the core of the Christian message. That's the gospel message. Here's what I find interesting about it. All three of those components are historical. What do I mean by that? Let's not jump the gun here. All three of those components are something that has something to do with history. Okay, they're not pure philosophy. They're not disembodied theology. Did a man named Jesus actually die on the cross or not? That's something that would have happened in the first century in history. It's a historical event, the death of a man named Jesus on the cross. Did that man in the first century actually claim to be God or not? That's something that would have happened in history. If we open up the history books, we can see, does it corroborate that claim or not? And number three, did that man rise from the dead? Now you might say, Nabil, that's a, that's a miracle. Yes, it is, but it's something that would have happened in the first century. Do we have historical records that would corroborate the claim of this historical event, someone rising from the dead? So now that's point one I want to share with you. And this is something that would have actually happened in history. Point number two is that it makes a case. What do I mean by that? When I was uh, in uh, medical school, I worked in the psychiatry ward a lot in my fourth year. I, I dealt a lot with depression. I felt a lot of uh, people were working with bodies, but not enough people were working with minds. And so I started to, to go to the psychiatry ward to work with depressed patients. Every now and then people would come in, and as we were interviewing them, they'd say something like, I am God. And the proper response to that is, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> people claim to be God all the time. The fact of the matter is, it's pathological. It's delusions of grandeur. And if Jesus in the first century claimed to be God, the proper response to that would be, you're crazy. But, if the person I'm interviewing at the hospital says, no, 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 not only am I claiming to be God, I'm going to prove it. Because I know that I will be killed. And three days later, to prove my claim to you, I will rise from the dead. Think about this. If someone says, I am God, big deal. Lots of people say that. But if somebody then says, no, I will prove it by rising from the dead, now we have something to watch. Now we have something to test to see whether that claim can be vindicated. So not only is this the core of the Christian faith, not only is it historical, as far as something that can be investigated in history, it's also a case. If Jesus claimed to be God and proved it by rising from the dead, we have a case for Christianity. There's a fourth thing I want to tell you about this verse, is that each of those points is contrary to what Islam claims about Jesus. In Islam, 
The Quran very clearly says in Surah An Nasa, chapter 4, verse 157, Jesus was not killed, nor was he crucified, but so it was made to appear. Islam categorically, explicitly denies that Jesus died by crucifixion. So, this is again where we say that, look, all religions are not the same. One religion is saying very clearly, Jesus did die by crucifixion. The other religion is saying, he did not die by crucifixion. Did Jesus claim to be God? Like we said, it's the core of the Christian faith. But in Islam, very clearly, Jesus denies claiming to be God. In chapter 5, verse 116, Jesus is having a conversation with Allah. It's an eschatological conversation. And Allah says, did you tell people to worship you? And he said, I would never say that. I didn't have the right to do that. Not only that, but chapter 5, verses 72 and 73 of the Quran say that if you believe Jesus is God, you are amongst the mushrik, and your abode is the hellfire. Wait a minute. Christianity says that you have to believe Jesus is God in order to be saved. Islam says if you believe Jesus is God, your abode is the hellfire. Again, that's chapter 5, verses 72 and 73 of the Quran. So, it's the core of the Christian faith, it is historically related, it makes a case, and it is a dividing line between Islam and Christianity. This is exactly what we should investigate to see whether or not the Christian faith has evidence and what it says to the Islamic faith. Now, I'm not here tonight to talk about Islam, actually. I'm just introing how I got to start talking about these three things. So, during the Q&A tonight, if you have questions about Islam, feel free to ask. But I'm here mainly to talk about texting your questions. <laughs> Whatever the title was that we had up there. Uh, I used a lot of alliteration. I thought that they would change it, but they didn't. Uh, critically considering Christian place. So, the first question I want to look at is, can we know about Jesus? We don't have to, and in fact, we should not, and I certainly did not, as a Muslim, trust the reliability of the Bible. I did not. i have been taught my whole life that things have been changed, and variants, etc. Let's look at what... The gospel records are. Now the first thing that I see people doing, the first mistake that I see people making is they treat the Bible as if it's one book. It's simply not. There's two large sections to it, the Old Testament and the New Testament. 39 books in one, 27 books in the other. The New Testament, the latter 27 books, the first five of them are historical books. They're written in the mode of history. Richard Burridge calls it Greco-Roman bioi, the genre of Greco-Roman biographies. So we take a look at those five books. The first four of them are the Gospels. The fifth book, Acts, is the second part to Luke's Gospel. So we have these four books about Jesus' life written from a historical perspective. What do they say? Are they reliable? How can we know? When I was at this point in, in my university studies, I was still studying medicine, but I said I have to figure out whether or not these books are reliable. How do I do that? Turns out that historians have a method of investigating texts to see how reliable they are and what they can know based on those texts. That's called the historical method. So it doesn't matter what you're studying. Uh, are you studying uh, the Civil War of the United States? Are you, are you studying you know, Genghis Khan? Are you studying whether or not Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon? Historians take a look at all the texts that they have and they say, how can we find the facts from these texts? Are these texts reliable enough to do so? And there are various methods that they use. One of the things that they look at is to see how many records we have of a specific event. So if you have one record of a specific event, you're not too sure whether that event actually happened or not. If you have multiple records, it's much more likely to have happened. And once again, what we're talking about on Jesus' life, we have four Gospels telling us about Jesus' life, four different perspectives. Granted, they're not completely independent of one another necessarily. We don't know how independent they are, but we've got multiple testimonies on Jesus' life. Another criteria that historians look at is how early the texts are. For example, when we're talking about Alexander the Great, we know quite a bit about Alexander the Great and how old he was when he started his military expeditions, how old he was when he died, what happened to his empire when he died. But did you know that the vast majority of what we know about Alexander the Great comes from a biography written 400 years after he died. And that's kind of fun. We can expect that from ancient documents. Lots of things didn't survive into the presence. When I was at Oxford, I learned about a uh, massive Jewish revolt 
that occurred about 115 AD. If you're into Jewish studies, you will know that the temple fell 70 AD, that there was a Bar Kokhba revolt where the Jews were, were just hoping to get Jerusalem back from the Romans. That was in 135 AD. There was another revolt in 115 AD, which is virtually absent from the history books. You only hear hints of it. But in that revolt, millions of Jews were slaughtered across the Mediterranean. The only way we know about it is by side comments and by buildings that have remained standing. A lot of those buildings were rebuilt and it said this building was rebuilt after the Jewish revolt. In one text, um, Arius, not Arius the Christian uh, heretic, but another Arius the historian, happened to make a side comment while he was talking about the reign of Hadrian as the Jews were being exterminated throughout Alexandria. This didn't show up anywhere in the historical records, virtually. Millions of people lost their lives. This is the nature of historical records. We've just often lost extremely important things. So the fact that we can rely on a historical re record on Alexander the Great, which is 400 years after his death, is not that strange. The fact that there are four Gospels on Jesus' life within 30 to 60 years after his death is phenomenally strange. We've got four books on the life of a Jewish carpenter living in Israel. Israel was considered a very unimportant area to the Romans. And yet Roman historians such as Tacitus are mentioning Jesus. That's very, very out of the ordinary. The fact that we have this much biographical evidence of Jesus' life is quite astounding. Yes, Mom? <laughs> you could please turn your phones off. I'd appreciate it. Um, the first of those four Gospels to have been written is Mark's Gospel. The last of those four Gospels is John's Gospel. Now, the latest consensus dating on Mark's Gospel is approximately 17 AD. Jesus lived 30 to 33 AD. So the latest consensus dating on Mark's Gospel is four decades. There are people in this room, plenty of you, who remember what happened in your life 40 years ago. And that's exactly what's happening in Mark's Gospel at the latest. Now, there are some scholars, for example, an atheist scholar by the name of James Crossley. I apologize. He's either atheist or agnostic. I'm not sure. James Crossley has dated Mark's Gospel at 36 to 42 AD. So six to ten years after Jesus. That is a newsflash, according to ancient history. This is the kind of record we have in the Gospel. The last of the four Gospels is John's Gospel, written at latest in 90 AD. Some people like J.A.T. Robinson put it in the mid-50s. So even John's Gospel could be 25 years or so after Jesus. But at the latest, 60 years after Jesus. This is phenomenally early stuff. The point I want to make with you right now, before we move on, is that it is so early, all of these Gospels are so early, that they can, and Christian tradition say, that they were written in the life of time of eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses were present as these were being written. In fact, Christian tradition says that eyewitnesses wrote the Gospels. Matthew and John, anyway. Mark is Peter's secretary, so he's listening to Peter and writing it down, which is, by the way, very common. Meyer bar Ilan, a Jewish scholar, has said that in the first century of Israel, 97% of people were illiterate. It's a pretty high number. So most people, when they wanted to write anything, would use a scribe. It makes complete sense that Peter would use Mark to write. And Luke was a historian. He was investigating things. If you read the beginning of, of Luke's gospel, it says that he made a very intentional effort to collect the history of Jesus' life. In fact, the, Hebrew, or the Greek word that's used there is hysteretsai. He's actually doing history as he's collecting Jesus' life. These are the records that we have on Jesus. Now, the question you might say is, Nabil, sure, fine and dandy, we've got four records that were written on Jesus' life very early, but that doesn't mean they were unbiased. And my response to you would be, you're right. It doesn't. But nothing that is ever written is unbiased. Every single record that we have has some sort of bias in it. If postmodernism has taught us anything, that's true. The narratives have some kind of impact from the agenda of the author. It doesn't matter who you are. That's the case. So the question isn't, were they biased? The question is, are they reliable? through their biases? Can we still find out historical truth despite the biases? And my answer to you is this. 
when it comes to the three events that we're looking at, did Jesus die on the cross, did he rise from the dead, and did he claim to be God, that the evidence is so strong that yes, we can rely. Now, by the way, I just want to clarify for you, I do believe as a Christian that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God. That is my theological belief. But when I'm objectively investigating, or trying to be objective, to investigate the Bible, I'm coming at them critically and carefully. So, while I'm doing this investigative business, I, I don't think I can conclude Jesus was virgin born. That wasn't written in Mark's Gospel, it was written in Matthew and Luke. So, it's not quite as strong as other claims are. As an objective historian investigator, I can't conclude that all the things written in the Gospels are true. As a Christian, I can come up to that conclusion, but not as a historian. Are you with me so far? Yet, what I'm arguing for you today is that even as a historian, I can conclude Jesus died on the cross, Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus claimed to be God. That's what I'm saying. So let's look at the first one of those. Did Jesus die on the cross or not? This argument that Jesus died on the cross is so strong that... Atheist and agnostic scholars, such as Paul Fredrickson, such as Marcus Borg, such as Bart Ehrman, all say the same thing. If there's one thing we can know about the historical Jesus, it's that he died by crucifixion. The records are that strong. Now, I'm not just giving you uh, a logical fallacy by appealing to authority. The point that I'm making is even people who are critical of the Christian religion are saying, and critical of the Bible for that matter, are saying the evidence is so strong that Jesus died by crucifixion. That is amongst the surest facts of history. That's what Paul Fredrickson said. Not just on Jesus' life, but history in general. Why can we say this? Well, not only do the four Gospels talk about Jesus' death by crucifixion, not only do Peter and Paul talk about Jesus' death by crucifixion, the author of Hebrews, not only do they, the Christians found in the New Testament, but you also have non-Christians, very soon after Jesus' death, relatively speaking, saying that Jesus died by crucifixion. One of them we've already mentioned, Tacitus. Josephus, the Jewish historian, also said that Jesus died by crucifixion. These are extra-biblical sources that are corroborating the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion. The evolution of Samasada who says it, Marabar Seraphim who says it, later we find it in the Talmud, another Jewish source, that Jesus died by crucifixion. So we have not only Christians saying it, but Jews, Greco-Romans, etc., all coming together and saying Jesus died by crucifixion. On the contrary, we have nobody who says he didn't die by crucifixion. Nobody at all until the mid-2nd century when the Gnostics said that Jesus is so divine he never had an earthly body and therefore he couldn't have died. He's kind of a ghost floating over the ground. Therefore he couldn't have died. That's the first time we have any historical record of people saying Jesus did not die by crucifixion. Why is it that everyone agrees Jesus died by crucifixion? Well, of course, that's the testimony that's spreading from early on. But in addition to that, the process of crucifixion was so stringent and so solid that nobody ever in all of history that's been reported survived a full Roman crucifixion. Not once. They would first flog you, and then after the flogging process, some people actually died during the flogging process. I don't know if you watched Mel Gibson's uh, Passion of the Christ. How many of you saw that movie? Good number of you. Uh, that is actually pretty close to the explanation of what happens during crucifixion. Cicero has said that the crucifixion process is so bad, let nobody even hear the word, no, sorry, let no Roman citizen ever hear the word crucifixion. Let them not even hear it. He said that people's skin would hang from their body in ribbons after being flogged. And when they'd be put on a poster, Abdominal walls would give way and their intestines would fall out because they were being flogged by a whip that was designed to cause your skin to fall off. I don't want to go too far into the details. I may have already done that, sorry about that. <laughs> There's more, trust me. But the crucifixion process and the flogging process was so strong and so intentionally designed to kill that never was anyone recorded surviving a full Roman crucifixion. At the end of the crucifixion process, by the way, there was something called a death blow. The Roman soldiers would make sure that you were dead. Why? Because if you survived this, then they would be killed in your place. So what would they do? Well, there are a few common ways of administering death blows. One of them was taking a sledgehammer, 
to the crucifixion victim's head. Another one is setting the body on fire. Uh, Josephus talks about this during the uh, temple's fall, that the Romans crucified Jews in all kinds of positions and then lit all their bodies on fire to make sure they were dead. Another one's taking the body down and throwing it into a pit and letting dogs eat the body. Another one is breaking the knees. Uh, why does that kill someone? Well, when you're hanging with, by your arms and you have no support, your knees have been broken, you're just hanging. After a while, you're not going to be able to breathe out. You have to push up to breathe out to create that positive pressure. And then when you sink back down, you breathe in just by a negative pressure. If you break the knees, you can't breathe, you die by asphyxiation. That's another method. And there's another method, which is taking a spear and thrusting it in someone's heart. And that's what we find happening in John's Gospel to Jesus. The only time there's ever any record of someone uh, surviving the crucifixion is when they did not have a full crucifixion. Uh, there was Josephus, actually, saw one of his buddies being crucified. He said he was, he was a, a Jewish general that had defected to the Romans. Great guy. Um, he told one of the Romans, take down my friend. And so they took him down early. They gave him a ton of medical attention. In fact, there were three friends. Two of them died anyway. That one guy survived. But he was never administered a death blow. No one who's ever received a full crucifixion ever survived the cross. That is why scholars saying we can be certain Jesus died by crucifixion. Fact number two. Did Jesus claim to be God? Now this is the one that mattered to me most as a Muslim. Because as a Muslim, I believe that Jesus was the Messiah. I believe that Jesus was a prophet, that he told the truth, that he never sinned, but that he never claimed to be God. How can you claim to be God? What I want to tell you right now is that the earliest stratum of Christian history uniformly attests to Jesus being God. All four Gospels say Jesus claimed to be God. Paul says Jesus claimed to be God. In other words, the evidence is so uniform. By the way, the Jews said Jesus claimed to be God. That's why they crucified him. So everyone who walks away from Jesus' life concludes this man claimed to be God, whether Jews or Christian. The records are uniform that Jesus actually proclaimed it himself. There's so much we can talk about here. When I was uh, studying at Duke University, I studied two things. I studied the Quran and I studied Mark's Gospel. Specifically, I studied Mark on the issue of whether or not Jesus was God, according to Mark. And there's so much I can talk about here. We're going to run out of time if I share all the details with you. But here's what I want to say. The first place people generally go to say Jesus claimed to be God is John's Gospel. Because it's so obvious in John's Gospel, you really can't miss it. The beginning of John's Gospel says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Kaikaos ein halagas, and God was the Word. And then we see in verse 2 and 3 that the universe was created through the Word. So this Word, here's God, and here's the Word, and the Word is God somehow. Okay, mind is kind of blown right there. <laughs> How is he with God and is God? But whatever, the Word is God. The universe was created through the Word. And then verse 14 tells us, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of God. In other words, this Word is Jesus. This Word through whom the universe is created, this Word which is God, that is Jesus. There's so much more to be said about John chapter 1. The prologue is a beautiful thing. And then throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus says things like, Worship me like you worship the Father. Jesus says things like, Anything you pray to me in my name when I'm gone, I will do it for you. John chapter 14. How could Jesus say, Pray to me and anything that you pray in my name, I will do for you when I'm gone? That means he has to be omnipotent to pray in anything. And that he'll be gone, he has to be omniscient, be able to hear and know that that's been prayed. These are the kinds of claims we find in John's Gospel. It really goes beyond contradiction. When we look at John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas has just placed his hands in Jesus' side, and he says to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Kuriosmu kaita asmu, my Lord and my God. He says it to Jesus. And Jesus basically says, Finally, <laughs> figured it out. So that's John's Gospel. Pretty much no scholar disagrees that John's Gospel claims to be God. Now when I saw that as a Muslim, I said, fine, 
John says it, but he's the last of the four Gospels. Why doesn't Mark say it? Because Mark, being the first of the four Gospels, we, if Jesus actually claimed to be God, we should see that at the very earliest level. And like I said, we're running out of time. If you're interested in this stuff, we can continue talking about this during the Q&A. How much time do we have left, Jane? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. So let me tell you this. If you look at Mark's Gospel, starting from the very beginning, Mark chapter 1, verse 1 says, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, that's interesting, but there's textual variance to that verse, so let's leave that aside. We go to the next verses. The next verses say that there's a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This is a reference to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, where Isaiah is saying, the Lord is coming. God is coming. There will be one who will proclaim that. God is coming. That person who will proclaim the coming of God himself, that person will be a voice in the wilderness. And then Mark says, that's John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the person, the voice crying in the wilderness, that the Lord is coming. Well, John the Baptist is proclaiming the coming of Jesus. Is Jesus the Lord himself? That's the first question we should ask when we read Mark's Gospel. If we know our Old Testament, that's the first question that would come to mind. Wait a minute. John the Baptist is proclaiming the coming of Jesus, but he's supposed to be proclaiming the coming of God himself. What's going on? You go into Mark chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus is about to heal a paralytic. And instead of healing him, this is where I think Jesus is pretty, pretty intense kind of guy. Uh, this guy wants to be healed. And instead of healing him, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Uh, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> and the Pharisees are saying, don't you realize only God can forgive sins? And Jesus' response to them is, so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, arise. In other words, yeah, anyone can say they have the authority to forgive sins, but check this out, I can heal it. That is proof, it's a sign, that I have the authority to forgive sins. Look, what did the, Jews, uh, the Jewish leaders just say in their hearts? That only God has the authority to forgive sins. What was Jesus' response? No, man can do it too. No, he says, yeah, and I can forgive sins. Let's juxtapose that with chapter 2, verse 28. Just 18 verses later. Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Whoa. Do we know what the Sabbath is in context of Jewish beliefs? The Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus here calls himself Lord of the Ten Commandments. We should start adding these puzzle pieces together. First, John the Baptist is proclaiming the way of the Lord, Jesus. Then Jesus says he has authority to forgive sins, something only God can do. Now he's saying he's Lord of the Sabbath, one of the Ten Commandments. As you go through Mark's Gospel, you see over and over that Jesus is proclaiming to do things and be things that only God is. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is shown stilling the storms and the seas. But in the Old Testament, it says, who is the one who stills the storms and the seas? Yahweh, God. In Mark chapter 6, verse 50, Jesus is walking on the water. And as he's passing on the water, we should remember Job chapter 9, verse 8 in the Septuagint, which says only Yahweh is the one who has the authority to walk on water. And yet Jesus doesn't. As we go throughout Mark's gospel, we see Jesus continuing to do this. But what I want to draw your attention to, what I think are the strongest bits of evidence, are the very end of Mark's gospel. Notice, by the way, if you're Muslim here, uh, you might ask this question. You might say, why does Jesus not just come out and say he is God? Well, he doesn't even come out and say he's the Messiah. He's not talking about himself. At, at no point in Mark's gospel does Jesus come out and say, I am the Messiah. And he doesn't say, I am God, until Mark 14, 62, where he does both things at once. The high priest says to Jesus, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? By the way, Christ is the same word for Messiah. Uh, Christ is the Greek, Messiah is the Hebrew. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus responds and says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. I really want to unpack this for you, uh, but I have to do it kind of quickly. When Jesus says he's the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, he's quoting a verse from the Old Testament. You should notice by now that Mark's Gospel is aimed towards Old Testament readers. He says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. That's a reference to Daniel chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, 
Daniel's having a vision, and he looks in the sky, and he sees one who looks like the ancient, uh, he sees the ancient of days, which is the Father, God, being worshipped by angels. And then he says, behold, in my night visions, I saw one coming on the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man, coming on the clouds of heaven. Time out. Let's time out right here. Let's make sure that we're all on the same page. What we're doing right now is checking to see whether Jesus claimed to be God. Mark's gospel, the earliest of the four gospels, says Jesus claims to be all these things that only God is. And then when he finally comes out and says, this is who I am, he refers us back to Daniel 7, 13. In that verse, we see God being worshipped by angels, and then we see a son of man approaching God the Father, the Ancient of Days. But he comes on the clouds of heaven. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, we see that only God comes on the clouds of heaven. What's going on? God's already here. Here's someone who looks like a human, but he's doing something that only God can do. This is weird. And then we go to the next verse. The next verse says, To him, to that Son of Man, was given glory, authority, and sovereign power. Wait a minute. I thought God was the only one in heaven with glory, authority, and sovereign power. No, Daniel 7 says there's a Son of Man who has glory, authority, and sovereign power in heaven. The next verse says, people of every nation and language will serve him. Whoa. The word serve there, by the way, is pelach. That's the word which means a divine service. Never in the Bible is that word used except to give a service to God. In fact, in one verse, People try to give the service to someone else, and God curses them. He says, that service is due only to me. Yet here, we see a service due only to God being given to a son of man. And the next verse is say, his kingdom will never pass away, his dominion will never be destroyed. Jesus says, check this out, you know yourselves, in the book of Daniel, there's someone next to God who is also doing the things that only God can do comes on the heavens like only God can do. He has authority over heaven like only God has. He is worshipped by all people the way only God can be worshipped. And he has dominion over heaven the way only God does. That son of man is me. That's what Jesus is saying in Mark 14. And as if that wasn't enough, he pairs it with another Old Testament reference. He says, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power. This is a reference to Psalm 110 verse 1. In Psalm 110, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and I will make the enemies a footstool for your feet. There is so much to unpack on this verse. But all I can tell you is what the Jews thought at that time of God. Never in any Second Temple Jewish writings is anyone actually depicted sitting next to God. Never. Because if you do, the image that's drawn is you're ruling the universe next to God. You're an heir of God. In that context, that's what that means. So never does anyone ever claim it, but Jesus claims it. I have the right to sit next to God and rule the universe with me. Now let's back up for a second. You might say, Nabil, fine. This is all found in Mark's gospel. Jesus claims to be God. He says it boldly. At the same time, he claims to be the Messiah. He also claims to be God. Fine. But that's Mark's gospel. How do we know Jesus actually claimed to be God? And the answer to that question is, because I said so. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the answer to that question is that historians take a look at these pieces of data and they say, which types of data are the strongest? You know, we can have various kinds of data, but which one is the absolute strongest? The absolute strongest kind of data in all of this critical study is called the criterion of dissimilarity. This data is so, this criterion is so stringent that people say we can't use it, it cuts out too much stuff. We can't use the criterion of dissimilarity because if we use it, we won't know anything about anything. That's how stringent this criteria is. Yet the claim that Jesus was the son of man from Daniel 7 passes that level of historical stringency. In other words, the most difficult test to pass about whether something's actually historical, these claims pass that. That's how strong the claim is that Jesus himself called himself the Son of Man from Daniel chapter 7. And also when it comes to sitting at the right hand of the power, 
This is the verse quoted over 20 times in the New Testament. It's the most commonly referenced verse from the Old Testament in the New Testament. In other words, this verse is so prevalent, the only way to explain how it's found everywhere in the earliest Christian data is if Jesus himself actually used it. There's no other way to explain it. So, this evidence is so strong, it passes the criterion of dissimilarity, and it's ubiquitous in the early New Testament evidence, the claim that Jesus is God. Now, did Jesus rise from the dead or not? As I see, we're beginning to wrap up on our time. Uh, I want to make sure we cover the major objections here. For number one, if you want to get more information on this, did Jesus rise from the dead or not? Um, check out a book written by Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona. Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona have written a book called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. I know we won't have time to cover all the details here, but The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus by Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona. Basically, Gary is a scholar who's been studying the historical Jesus since 1975. That's when he published his dissertation. What Gary did was he read every single article published about the historical Jesus. Watch me now. He, he read every single article published about the historical Jesus in French, German, and English for 30 years. French, German, and English. Every scholarly journal article on the historical Jesus. And he says, what do all these scholars believe? What are the common beliefs of all these scholars? In other words, what pieces of data are so strong that everyone believes it? He came up with 20 such pieces of data. And he says, let's limit it to just three for a moment. Let's just see three pieces of data that are so strong that virtually everyone agrees with them. Number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. We already looked at the evidence for that. Number two... He argues that all the historians studying this, virtually all of them, agree that the disciples of Jesus truly believed that they had seen the risen Jesus. Okay, you might be thoroughly unimpressed by that. But there's an important point here. The disciples truly believed that they had seen the risen Jesus. That doesn't mean they're right. We're not saying that means they're right. Data number three, that certain enemies of Jesus truly believed they had seen the risen Jesus. Well, that's interesting. Who do we have in mind? We have in mind Paul, who was hunting down Christians and killing them, and also James from the Jerusalem church, who was not a Christian in Jesus' life. And in fact, he came to collect Jesus and say he was out of his mind in Mark chapter 3. Yet we find him believing in Jesus and his resurrection. So three bits of data that Gary Habermas points us out to that scholars that are skeptics, atheists, agnostics, all the scholars agree with. Jesus died by crucifixion. His disciples believed they had seen him risen. And enemies of Jesus believed they had seen him risen. He asks the simple question, hey guys, we're historians. What we're supposed to do is explain the data. What is the best explanation for the data? Give me some accounts that can explain these three points of data. The best hypothesis to explain these three points of data is that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Let's think about this for a moment. If Jesus rose from the dead, is it true that he had died on the cross? Yes. Does it explain why disciples believed he had risen? Yes. Does it explain why enemies of Jesus believed he had risen? Yes. This hypothesis explains the data perfectly. It fits comfortably. What about like, alternative explanations? Let's just consider some alternative explanations. The most common alternative explanation is that the disciples hallucinated Jesus' resurrection. They thought they saw Jesus come back because they missed him so much, they really wanted him to survive, and so they just imagined his return. Okay, let's see if that fits the data. If the disciples hallucinated Jesus' return, does that explain that Jesus died by crucifixion? Yeah, if they hallucinated his return, Jesus could have died by crucifixion. Does it explain that the disciples truly believed Jesus had risen? Well, kind of. Sort of. Because the fact of the matter is, there is no evidence of a mass hallucination. Okay, 12 people at once, or in fact 500 people at once, don't hallucinate the same thing. It doesn't happen. You have to invent a miracle in order to preclude a miracle if you want to say that the disciples all hallucinated the risen Jesus. But let's just say for a moment, okay, fine, the disciples, it does explain that fact. Fact number three, 
that enemies of Jesus believed they had seen him risen. Now, if the disciples are hallucinating the risen Jesus, why, did, why do all of a sudden enemies of Jesus believe Jesus had risen from the dead? Paul had no reason to hallucinate the risen Jesus. In order to become a Christian, he had to give up everything. He had to get flogged. He was stoned multiple times. Ultimately, he was killed for his Christian faith. Why would such a man hallucinate the risen Jesus? He had nothing to gain from it, only a lot to lose. It doesn't make sense. And the same with James. Why did James hallucinate the risen Jesus? It doesn't make sense. That idea does not fit the facts. And as respectable scholars, we're supposed to throw such ideas out. All right? What other hypothesis about Jesus' death could fit the facts? Well, the one that I believed uh, as a Muslim was that Jesus didn't actually die by crucifixion, that he survived it. Okay? Does that fit the facts? Fact number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. It doesn't fit that fact. Um, it is so obvious historically that Jesus died by crucifixion. It does not work historically. We can say it unhistorically, but not as historians can we conclude Jesus survived the cross. But point number two, and this may be a more critical matter here, David Strauss, who was himself an atheist, argued this. The disciples preached that Jesus was the Lord of life himself. They're going out and willing to die for the claim that Jesus is the Lord of life. If Jesus had somehow survived the crucifixion, they wouldn't all of a sudden see him as the risen Lord of life. They would say, dude, let's get you to a hospital. You need help. But the disciples were willing to say Jesus was the Lord of life, and they gave themselves up for that belief. You cannot explain it if Jesus somehow survived the crucifixion. All the alternate theories on what could have happened, given the facts, simply don't fit. So my conclusion for you today is that the best historical conclusion regarding the events surrounding Jesus' death is that he rose from the dead. Now, by the way, as we wrap up, I have to tell you that studying these three bits of data was one part of my spiritual journey. Nobody makes decisions based off of pure data alone. We're not machines. In fact, those who have that degree of inability to process emotion and social connection are pathological. The diseases called autism. Only they are purely rational. The rest of us generally have other things that come into play. And for me, the issue was my heritage, my family, my friends, they were all Muslim. I had three Christian friends, and they were all white, and I wasn't, so it was weird. I didn't like going to church. People would stand up in front of the church and sing songs. I thought that was blasphemous. I said, what, you're standing between me and God? What are you doing? I didn't like that. And Christians looked at me honestly, and they didn't know what to do with me, because I was a Muslim. And so I didn't want to leave Islam for Christianity. I had to give up everything to do that, but the evidence was so solid that at one point, I just had to look at it and say, if I continue to stay a Muslim, I am being a hypocrite, because I don't believe it anymore. The evidence is that strong. And so at that point, I was able to start pursuing God and saying, God, who are you? You tell me. And here's the point I wanted to leave us with today. At the end of all this, I am here to tell you about the Christian God, who, according to Christians, claims to be a personal Right? This isn't something we believe in that's disembodied from reality. Okay? This is your creator who made you for a purpose, who designed you as you are, and who loves you as you are. And he is not someone that we just have to read about in the books. We can call out to him. We can ask him to reveal himself to us. So if you're in the throes of this journey, I would say, alongside all these studies, make sure that you actually treat him as a real being. And remember that who God is and what you do with him is the most important question you will ever ask yourself. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. So question, uh, question number one uh, for you, Nabil. Uh, are there historians other uh, than New Testament scholars who agree with the evidence uh, for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ.
Great question. Historians other than New Testament ones. I think that's a good question. I think what's being asked behind that, and I probably should have clarified this during my talk, um, is are there non-Christians who agree with this? Um, I think that's the question behind this. Uh, well, I should clarify that most of the scholars that I know in the United States who come to conferences like the Society of Biblical Literature and the American Academy of Religion are not Christians. When I studied at Duke University, um, I studied under many non-Christians. Uh, when I went to UNC, for example, there was a bus that would take you from Duke to UNC if you wanted to study there. I studied under Bart Ehrman, who is perhaps the most famous non-Christian critic of the Bible. Uh, he has done a fantastic job of getting Christians to leave Christianity because of his criticism of the Bible. Uh, and he is a New Testament scholar. So by no means is he someone who believes in the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, and yet he's a New Testament scholar. So when I say things like New Testament scholar, I'm not saying Christian. I'm saying someone who's dedicated their lives to studying these things. And uh, once you see it from that angle, it's pretty clear that, yes, there are many non-Christians. But if you say, are there historians other than New Testament scholars who agree with the evidence for the death and resurrection of Christ, um, well, the people who study the death and resurrection of Christ at that gradual level are New Testament scholars. So basically, if there's, you know, a botanist studying the death and resurrection of Jesus' life, I'm like, so what? <laughs> I mean, good for you, you know, plants and such, but you didn't, I don't really care what you think about Jesus' life. Yeah, can I have something? Sure. Actually, while, uh, while Nabil was uh, speaking, though, I had my phone out, um, level three of Kent Note. Um, and uh, one of the interesting ones, I mean, like, uh, I've also done a lot of uh, historical scholarship, like, uh, like Nabil, it's one of the things that first drew us together. And actually, one of the scholars I've long found uh, interesting is a Jewish uh, scholar called Pinkas Lahide. Pinkas, uh, no longer with us, I think he died a couple of years ago. Interesting, Jewish scholar, remained a Jew till the day he died, wasn't become a Christian, but became fascinated uh, by the evidence for the resurrection. Let me read you what, what he said, has to say. Uh, particularly about something that Nabil pointed to uh, in his talk, the way that the disciples, the, the followers of Jesus, were convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead. So this is from a Jewish scholar, not a Christian scholar. This is what he says. He says, if the disciples were totally disappointed and on the verge of desperate flight because of the very real reason of the crucifixion, i.e. they'd just seen Jesus arrested and crucified and they were afraid the same thing would happen to them, he writes, it took another very real reason in order to transform them from a group of disheartened and dejected Jews into the most self-confident missionary society in world history. And towards the end of his career, he became increasingly convinced that something very like the resurrection had to have happened, although it didn't lead him all the way, funnily enough, to actually change his You know, that's a very good point, and I should probably come at it from that angle. For example, what did I tell you about the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, verse 157, it says, Jesus did not die by crucifixion. That's what the Quran says, so all Muslims should believe that, right? Well, there's a Muslim scholar uh, who became very popular a few years ago named Reza Aslan, who lives in California, and his conclusion was that, yes, I'm a Muslim, yes, the Quran says Jesus did not die by crucifixion, but the history is so strong, I have to believe, as a historian, that Jesus died by crucifixion. So here's a Muslim saying, even though the Quran says it, I have to believe it, because the history is that strong. And when it comes to the resurrection, what does he say? This is in his book, Zealot, by the way. Uh, what does he say when it comes to the resurrection? He says, something happened. I don't know what, but something happened. In fact, the word he uses is extraordinary. Something extraordinary happened. Extra extraordinary, not normal, happened at that point. Uh, Bart Ehrman, who I studied under, of course, believed Jesus died by crucifixion. And when it came to the resurrection, he said, yes, something happened. We don't know what, but something happened. Now, what is it that stops Bart Ehrman from saying, ah, the resurrection happened? He believes that that's not something a historian can conclude. He says it involves a miracle. Historians are not allowed to say a miracle happened. I disagree with that. I think that historians are supposed to give you the best explanation for the evidence. Uh, they're not supposed to say, well, God doesn't exist, therefore miracles can't happen. So, yeah, I agree with his basic principle. You shouldn't just say miracle for everything. But if someone says, I'm going to rise from the dead, and then something extraordinary happens, which makes it look like he rose from the dead, it's probably a good conclusion he rose. And by the way, Bart Ehrman, again, the same guy who was the most vociferous against the Bible, now agrees that all four of the Gospels show Jesus claiming to be God. Interesting. 
Great, thank you, Nabil. So, next question. Okay, so second question. Uh, you talked towards the end of uh, your talk, Nabil, about uh, this, uh, this idea of the criterion of uh, dissimilarity. Um, how does that apply to the gospel? It's obviously to you and I, people can see we're dissimilar. Uh, how does, how does, thank you, three people. Um, <laughs> but how does that apply to the gospel? What does it mean? Why is it important? How does it work? This is a great question. It gets kind of technical. For those of you who might want to look it up later, the criterion of dissimilarity is also called the criterion of double dissimilarity. It's the same thing. Um, what it is, is some, some people were taking a look at Jesus' life. They're, by the way, people get really hyper-skeptical when they study the historical Jesus. A lot of other historians take a look at New Testament scholars. They say, what the heck are you doing? Like, you're just, you just don't believe anything that's being said. Why are you doing that? This was one of those things. They said, if Jesus meets the expectations of the, the Jews who were around at the time, then basically the, the Jesus that's being recorded is being invented because the Christians are just inventing something that people were expecting. So that's, Jesus needs to be dissimilar from the expectation of the Jews in order for us to be sure that the, the histor history that's being recorded is accurate. Does that make sense? For example, if Jews are expecting, let's just say, I'm just giving you an example, let's just say Jews are expecting uh, a guy with a ponytail, right? And then the early Christian historians say Jesus had a ponytail. Well, you just made that up because that's what people were expecting. Does that make sense? So they're saying you, can, you cannot trust anything that Jews were expecting, and you cannot trust anything that the church remembered Jesus as being. So for example, the church constantly says Jesus is the Son of God, well, therefore, in the Gospels, when Jesus says he's the Son of God, they're just sticking those words into his mouth, because that's the way they talk about it. So to be sure of anything about the historical Jesus, the records have to not match the expectation, and they have to not match the way the church talked about it. Well, that's utterly ridiculous, because then you, take, then you come up with a Jesus who looks nothing like a Jew and nothing like a Christian. He looks like a hippie, which is, which is what most scholars think Jesus is. Now, the criterion of dissimilarity is met by the Son of Man criterion because no Jew was considering the Messiah to claim to be the Son of Man. That was not a common expectation by any means. Also, the early church never really called Jesus the Son of Man. If you look through the New Testament, 80 times the word Son of Man is used, and only twice do we see it uh, in the Gospels and the book of Acts outside of Jesus' own lips. One time in John chapter 12, where the Jews say, who is the Son of Man? They're like, what are you, who are you talking about? Um, and then one time in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen says, I saw the Son of Man. Other than that, Jesus is the only one using the word Son of Man for himself. So the Jews weren't expecting it, and the early church didn't use it, so therefore it fits this ultra-stringent criterion of double dissimilarity. Therefore we can be confident Jesus called himself this Son of Man. Okay, thank you. Okay, so third question, what's next? Okay, interesting. So, a question here, I'm unpacking a little about uh, some of the material around, uh, around visions uh, and, uh, and miracles. Uh, the question is, people have mass visions of, uh, of uh, the Virgin Mary, of Mary and Catholicism. How is that different uh, from the explanation that the disciples may have had mass hallucinations of Jesus? That's a good question. Now, if you want to go more into these issues, I suggest Michael Lacona's uh, dissertation that just got published by Erdman's a few years ago. It's called The Historical Evidence for the Resurrection of Jesus. Uh, the Resurrection of Jesus, a new historiographic approach. I was completely wrong. <laughs> Say it again. Uh, the Resurrection of Jesus, and the subtitle is A New Historiographic Approach. That's Big fat one. book, you can beat elephants to death with it if you wanted to. Uh, Although we shouldn't. But we shouldn't. We signed elephants. <laughs> Um, anyway, to answer the question, um, all the apparitions of Mary that we have, at least to my understanding, now I'm not an expert in this field, so uh, you know, make sure you double check what I'm saying here, I don't want to tell you anything wrong, but from what I understand of the apparitions of Mary, there was always something there. There's always some image that they're seeing, or they're seeing some kind of window, or they're seeing some kind of piece of toast, I don't know what it is, but there, there's always something that's being seen. Now, I don't mean to make fun of it, by the way, but uh, I just can't think of any of the real examples right now. Um, there's always something being seen, and people say, aha, in that I see Mary. 
That's not a hallucination, by the way. That's called an illusion. Two different categories. Uh, when it comes to hallucinations, there is nothing to be seen, and then all of a sudden you see something. And that does not happen uh, as, as a mass experience. Uh, it's not reported to have ever happened. But even if it happened among two, three people or something like that, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, um, by the way, definitely get acquainted with 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. The most skeptical New Testament scholars, again, atheists, agnostics, etc., they form a group called the Jesus Seminar. And basically what they do is they, they say, Jesus didn't say much of anything that you find in the New Testament. He just said some of these things. That ultra-skeptical group says the creed found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, comes within two to five years after Jesus' death. Wow, that's really, really early. Jesus dies, and then you have this creed that Christians formulate. And skeptical scholars, atheists and agnostics, are saying that comes within uh, two to five years after Jesus' death. Um, one highly respected New Testament scholar, James D.G. Dunn, who's just retired out of Durham in England, he says that this creed comes within six months of Jesus' death by crucifixion. And they have their reasons. We can't go into it for the time being. But the point I want to make is in that creed, it says that Jesus has appeared to 500 people at once. Not like just 12 disciples said, hey, we're going we're gonna to say that he has reappeared. 500 people at once saw him. This is the historical evidence that goes right close to the life of Jesus himself. Some respectable scholars saying within the year Jesus was crucified. That's great. Do you mind if I add something to that? No. Right, yes, safe old friends. There we go. So, uh, oh, no, you don't mind. But no, I couldn't. There we go. So, uh, let me add a couple of things actually to that. Uh, one of the very interesting things on the whole hallucinations uh, question that I discovered when I did some, uh, some study on the historicity, historicity of the resurrection is that people often ask the mass, solution, mass, mass hallucinations question, maybe the disciples hallucinated. When you actually go, uh, through the psychological literature. And I had uh, some friends who were psychologists because I, I have a background in working in mental health, so I have some connections in this field. I've got a few people to go through the literature for me. There is literally nothing, no uh, accounts of mass hallucinations to be found in the journals of psychology. Lots of work done on hallucinations, but there are not actually any known accounts of mass hallucinations. And psychologists who study these things will tell you it's a popular myth that there are such things. We don't actually have any examples for psychologists to study. In short, mass hallucinations themselves seem to be a hallucination. People don't have mass uh, hallucinations. Sometimes people will report that they saw things, but when you dig deeper, uh, they didn't actually happen. Secondly, uh, quickly, the interesting thing as well about the um, resurrection appearances uh, in the New Testament that Nibiel briefly touched on in his talk, but is worth just flagging up again, is they have a physical quality. To them. So it's not just the disciples see Jesus, they interact uh, with him, they, uh, they touch him, they shake his hands, they embrace, they eat breakfast uh, together. There's that kind of physical quality that's hard to explain if you're merely dealing with hallucinations. It's one thing to have a hallucination, it's the next thing to see that the hallucination has eaten your fish for breakfast and left the bones on the floor. Another good question entirely. And then lastly, and we'll take the next question, one of the things that intrigues me most about the resurrection appearances uh, in the New Testament, I can't remember if in the Bible you touched on this, is that the way that those, the way that those who are <laughs> not a hallucination, I can safely tell you, he's physical. He says hallucination so much, I wonder if someone's paying him for each time he Absolutely. says it. Absolutely, I'm, uh, I'm paid by the um, I'm paid by the syllable transubstantiation. There's a long way for you. Um, is the is the response of those who are enemies and uh, and hostile? Uh, two particular examples in the New Testament would be the Apostle Paul, uh, who wrote much of the New Testament. He was a skeptic, a uh, persecutor, in fact, of the early church until he encountered the risen Jesus. And then, the one that's often missed is James, the brother of Jesus, uh, who during the uh, ministry of Jesus, while Jesus is uh, teaching and preaching, <coughs> if you read the Gospels carefully, it's pretty clear that his brother James believed his brother was bonkers. That's the technical term. Mad, a lunatic. Someone you want to say. James is so often missed that Andy missed it when I talked about it during my talk. <laughs> I was there. Uh, but here's the interesting. I'm a great one. I was live tweeting you, my friend. So there you go. I can't multitask. But here's the interesting thing about James is that Bart Ehrman, who you've uh, quoted, uh, did you know this story about Bart? Not yet. Okay, here we go. As that uh, one of my uh, one of my friends once asked Bart Ehrman over supper, Bart, just out of interest, 
Do you think, even as an atheist and a sceptic, do you think, thinking back to your old days as a Christian, could you construct an argument, historical argument for the resurrection? And Bart took a swig of his beer and he went, do you know what? Do you know what? I think I probably could. And my friend, that's very interesting. What would be the planks of your argument? And he took another swig of his beer and Bart Ehrman says, you know what? I think if I was going to mount an argument for the resurrection of Jesus, I would begin with James, the brother of Jesus. I, to this day, still find that troubling and hard to explain. How somebody who was that close to Jesus could be convinced that he was the risen Lord and Christ. I would make that the central aspect of my argument. And I thought that was interesting on the lips of a skeptic and a doubter. That's helpful. There we go. Right, see, just that little bit was. Just that always yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He's paid by the insult. Um, so next question. <laughs> what would you respond? What would you respond to the agnostic who claims the Gospels were written pseudonymously? There's a long word. I'm glad I'm paid by the syllable. And uh, only credited to particular disciples much after the fact. If the authorship is called into question, wouldn't it follow that the content may be unreliable as well? Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, these are the kinds of questions that have been explored by scholarship uh, for the past couple hundred years uh, in the critical West. Did you have an answer you wanted to give before I... Um, no, 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 you carry on. But the first thing I would say is that we have an early Christian community that is interacting with these people. So the Christians aren't, it's not like someone's hiding in his cubbyhole and writing something and nobody knows him. Right? All the Christians are interacting with each other. The churches are connected to each other. They're sending help to one another. We see this in Paul's letters. We see it again in, of course, the book of Revelation. We see it in lots of places in the New Testament. So if people are writing that early after Jesus' life, it's within the lifetime of the disciples. Richard Baucom says, uh, Richard Baucom is a, a scholar who's just retired out of uh, Edinburgh. Uh, no, the other Scottish University. St. Andrews. St. Andrews. There's only two. <laughs> Getting um, He says that there are people who were kind of the authorities within the early Christian church. So people like Peter, people like Mary, people like Paul, people like the other ten, uh, 11 disciples. All these people act as controls. He, call, he calls them tradings. These are tradings who could control the stories that were going around because they were the authorities. And so if someone's writing a pseudonymous gospel and takes it to one of them, they would say, this is nuts. This isn't actually written by the person who says they write it. This stuff is false. You have to remember that this all came in the context of an early Christian church that knew one another. Now, the reason why this hasn't been emphasized by scholarship over the past hundred years is because scholars have been using a method of criticizing the New Testament, especially starting from Rudolf Bultmann all the way onwards through the Second World War till now, called form criticism. Actually, this probably died its death ten years ago or so. But it was a presupposition of form criticism that it was a long time before the New Testament Gospels were written and people had, the, the, the stories had changed and shifted over time. This was a presupposition of form criticism, not a conclusion after looking at the evidence. They presupposed it. And this is no longer the method that's used by New Testament scholars today. So these kinds of arguments are falling out of favor. But one other thing that I would want to say is uh, Richard Bauckham does point out, by the way, that someone named Papias, um, who knew Polycarp. Polycarp was a student of, John's, uh, of John, the disciple, so the guy who wrote John's Gospel. Papias is a student of his student. And he lived probably at the end of the first century or so, beginning of the second century, around there. Richard Bauckham argues that the experience he talks about is from the end of the second century, or the end of the first century. And he says that they interacted with those who had seen Jesus. So living at the end of the first century, he says they interacted with those who had seen Jesus. And Papias is the one who records that Peter's secretary was Mark, and that Mark wrote down what Peter said. That Matthew wrote down his gospel. So what do we have? We have people who interacted with this first generation testifying that yes, that gospel is written by that person, that gospel is written by that person. So number one, not only would we expect something uh, someone to have said something if there were false gospels floating around, pseudonymous ones anyway, 
But number two, we actually have very early records of people who were there at the time saying, yes, this is written by the right person. Scholarship has tended to ignore this because of the presuppositions of form criticism. I think those are going to change over the next few years. Great, thanks for the answer uh, to that. So, next, uh, next question. Um, according to Luke uh, chapter 1, there are many accounts that were written of the life of Jesus. As a Christian, how do I answer the claim uh, that the church picked which accounts to include in the Bible that we're reading today? Um, no, you too. Do you even know anything? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm giving you the honor. Okay, so. Uh, see, what I have to, see what I have to contend with? I, before he answers this, I, I will just gently point out that uh, a couple of days ago, Nabil uh, tweeted this. Oh, boy. Um, back in the USA, 24 hours. Oh, boy. There's no place like home. I look forward to seeing some of my friends in Toronto this weekend. Nabil, <laughs> it's great to have you here in Canada. <laughs> and would you share with our Canadian friends uh, the answer to this question? <laughs> Thanks, Ed. You're welcome, my friend. <laughs> Next thing I'll be tweeting is your home address. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do I answer the claim that the church picked which accounts to include in the Bible that we're reading today? This seems to be the heart of the question. Yeah. Luke chapter 1 does say that there are many accounts of Jesus, but Luke is not just talking about written accounts. He's also talking about people who are sharing stories. Uh, there is a, a fairly common consensus among scholarship that Luke actually interviewed Mary. When you read the first few chapters of Luke's gospel, you find information that sounds like it could have only come from Mary herself. And so there are many scholars of the New Testament, both Christian and non-Christian, who think Luke interviewed Mary. That's the kind of uh, historical work that Luke was engaged in. Not just Mary, but others too. We know that Luke used Mark's gospel. We, I, I believe anyway, and so does Austin Ferrer, who first considered this argument, that Luke also used Matthew's gospel. So when he says there are many written accounts, he could be referring to, and I think he did use Matthew and Mark. And I'm not alone in that. There are others as well. Perhaps those are the ones he's referring to. Regardless, the church didn't come together in 393 AD and conspire and say, we're going to pick exactly these books and we're going to remove these books. What happened from early times, like Polycarp, who I've already mentioned, and other early, New Test uh, early Christians, they would quote from books. Now, when Jesus quotes the Old Testament, for example, in the Gospels, he uses introductory formulae. For example, he'll say things like, you have heard... It has been said, or it has been told to you that, and then when he says that, he quotes the Old Testament, right? Those are called, by Richard Bauckham in his book, by the way, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, those are called introductory formulae. This is what somebody says when they're about to quote scripture. The argument Bauckham uses is that the exact same introductions are used of the books of Mark and Matthew and Luke and John, and many of Paul's writings, the way that people introduce scripture, they then use for these books. And when do they start doing that? Well, Polycarp dies in the first part of the second century. It's done then. Some people say that it was done as early as 96 AD. Regardless, people are using the four gospels as scripture within 50 years of their writing. Very, very early, and they're introducing it in that way. By the time uh, Irenaeus comes around at 180 AD. I'm pretty sure it was Irenaeus. It's not. It's Ignatius. He says that the four Gospels are as obviously the Word of God as there are four directional, four cardinal winds. There are four Gospels. People are now referring to these four Gospels in their letters, in their sermons, as the Word of God. So it's not like in the 4th century someone says, mm, that one, that one, that one, those are the Bible. No, people have been using the Scripture that way. There are only some books that had any degree of controversy at all. Uh, for example, the book of Revelation, 2 Peter, Jude. These books, people had some controversy. They're like, should we use that? Should we not? And the reason why, by the way, there was some controversy over which books to use and which not to use is because Christians at various times in Roman history, if they assembled, they would be killed for it. We know that there was a great persecution of the Christians starting at the beginning of the 4th century, uh, uh, called by the Roman emperor Diocletian. Diocletian says you have to give over your books 
of the Bible, and we're going to start burning your churches, and if you gather as Christians, we are going to kill you. So how are Christians going to gather and discuss the books of the Bible in this kind of environment, where they can be killed for? And by the way, you couldn't just Xerox a copy of a book. It took a lot of work and effort to get a copy of a book. So are they going to just gather frivolously and, and risk arrest and giving up their Holy Scripture? In fact, there were Christians who would die before giving up their books of Scripture. A Roman soldier would come to them and say, give us your books. They would say, no, we're not going to. And they'd be killed for that. Those who did give over the books were those who traded their Scripture for their lives. That was, those people were called traditores. And that's where we get the word traitor from. Someone who handed over the Christian scripture in, so, so as to save their lives. During the Diocletian Edict, this was the kind of persecution that was happening with Christians. When Constantine comes into power, all of a sudden now the Romans are okay with Christians gathering. They have absolutely zero concern about meeting publicly and discussing. In fact, Constantine himself called together a council in order for people to meet. That was when people could start saying, hey, you guys in Spain, what books have you been using? Hey, you guys up in, in Britannia, what have you guys been doing? Wherever people were, then they all came together, gathered and discussed, and they said, whoa, we've been using virtually the same books. The only disagreement we have are on these few. And those books are not the Gospels, they're not Acts, they're not Paul's letters, they're not anything that we get our doctrine from. So that's the history of, of the New Testament. The Gospels were understood to be scripture very early after they had been written, and that never really came under any kind of controversy. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions before we wrap tonight up, so uh, what's next? Okay, so, um, take, uh, orientating now from the Bible to perhaps a comparison with the, uh, with the Quran, the deal. The question is, if possible, uh, please speak about a uh, Quranic manuscript tradition and uh, the quotation from the Quran, which says that God protects it from textual corruption. This is a good question. Uh, it takes a long time to talk about. Mm. Um, I have a two hour video online. I was teaching a graduate level class at Biola University uh, in 2010, I believe it was. You can go online, you can type the Bil Qureshi, Biola, that's B-I-O-L-A, um, in Quran, and you'll get two hours on this stuff. Um, I've also done some debates on the preservation of the Quran. I've done some debates on the supposed scientific miracles of the Quran. It's all available on YouTube for free. So go check that stuff out. For now, I'll just tell you the chapter which says the Quran will be preserved. It's not exactly what it says, but it's found in chapter 15 of the Quran, where it says that uh, Allah has, uh, will preserve the Quran. Um, uh, Muslims often take that to mean that the Quran has never, ever been changed, not one letter, not one dash, not anything, exactly as it is. <laughs> From Muhammad till now, it's been always the same. That's what I was taught as a young Muslim. The fact of the matter is, uh, you can't even begin to say that about the Quran. Uh, because the Quran did not exist as a written text when it came. It was primarily an oral text, one that was spoken. Arabic as a language had not been codified such that it could capture the complexities of a prose work. Let me put this another way. By the time the Quran supposedly came, the beginning of the 7th century, there was no such thing as an Arabic book. There never was one. Arabic had not been codified such that a book could be written. It was the Quran itself that drove the production of an Arabic script that could capture the complexities of the Quran. So, in fact, um, what you have in the earliest manuscripts of the Quran, such as the one that has been in the news recently, uh, the Birmingham Manuscript, is you have the skeletal letters of the, uh, of the Arabic, the consonantal letters, it's kind of like Hebrew insofar as the words are all composed of triliteral roots. Later, the dashes were added, later 2,000 olives were added to the Quranic text. So it's not that no dash was added to the Quran, all the dashes were added to the Quran after the Quran came. Now does this necessarily change the meaning of the Quran? I don't think so. What's more difficult for the meaning of the Qur'an, what's more difficult for the canon of the Qur'an, is the problem that the earliest Muslims, who Muhammad hand-picked to teach the Qur'an, they didn't agree on the canon. In other words, the leader that uh, Muhammad picked and said, this guy, he named him first, Abdullah ibn Masud. Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Qur'an, learn it from four. By the way, for those of you who don't know this, 
This is found in Sahih al-Bukhari. This is the most trustworthy collection of hadith according to the average Sunni Muslim. And Sunni Muslims, by the way, make up approximately 80 to 85 percent of Muslims. So, if you run into a Muslim, they're probably going to be Sunni. They will say Sahih Bukhari is the most reliable book about Muhammad's life. Well, Volume Six, Book 61, is all about the collection of the Quran. And in that book, we find this hadith that Muhammad named four people to teach the Quran. The first person he mentioned is Abdullah ibn Masud. Well, Abdullah ibn Masud thought that there are only supposed to be 111 chapters in the Quran. The next, or one of the four people that Muhammad mentions is Ubay ibn Ghab. So Muhammad says, learn the Quran from four. Abdullah he named first, Ubay he named last. Ubay thinks that there's supposed to be 116 chapters of the Quran. So they disagree on which chapters belong in the Quran and which don't. Of course, today's Quran, which is not written by any of those four, but Zayd bin Thabit is the one who collected it, he says 114 chapters. So you have disagreements over which chapters belong in the Quran. Uh, when we look at some of the earliest records of what was in some of these chapters, some has been left out. So Abdullah ibn, and Ubay both agree that the verse of stoning should be in the Quran. There's a verse that's talked about in Sayyid Bukhari called the verse of stoning. And uh, the people in Sayyid Bukhari say, we practiced it, we did this, we stoned adulterers. It was part of the word of Allah. But today's Quran does not have that text in it. Both Abdullah and Ubay say, contain it. And today's Quran does not contain it. So the people Muhammad handpicked to teach the Qur'an uh, disagree with today's Qur'an. And we find records actually when today's Qur'an, in fact the predecessor of today's Qur'an, came out. Uh, Ubay, uh, Abdullah ibn Masood, according to uh, the records of Ibn Sa'd's Tabaqat, he said, do not trust this book. Do not trust this Qur'an, which is now the modern day Qur'an. The man that Muhammad handpicked said, don't trust it. All these things come out when you start investigating the earliest records. Now, some of you might be hearing this and saying, no, Nabil, you're wrong, you're making all this up, it's wrong. Fine, if you believe that, fine. I didn't believe it the first time I heard it either. So please investigate and ask God to guide you uh, to the truth as you investigate. And it's my prayer that you'll see the same down in the way I do. Mm. Now, by the way, this is Andy's PhD, so you better have something to say <laughs> on this topic. Well, I was going to say, I was going to say a couple of things. I mean, it's interesting, I mean, what I'll do in a minute is I'll host. I was going to, I'll have a story about Whitman and Burning, but, um, but my own PhD was actually in not so much how the Quran was transmitted, how the Quran was put together. And uh, one of the things I was uh, privileged to do was, uh, and others have done similar work now, was to uh, have the opportunity to develop some computer software for analysing the Arabic text of the Quran, looking for signs of how the Quran was first composed. And uh, we've got some quite sophisticated tools now, computerised tools for analysing texts. And what's interesting is I've long had a suspicion that the Quran looks like the kind of text that was originally composed orally, live in performance. And what that means is in cultures where writing hasn't yet been developed, uh, singers and storytellers and preachers and poets and so forth, uh, when they want to perform in front of an audience, have to construct their performance live uh, in front of the audience. We still have echoes of this today. If any of you have uh, children, if you're older, or brothers or sisters, or nephews or nieces, a little four or five year old comes to you and says, you know, will you tell me the story of the three little pigs? You know, that fairy story. Unless your hobby is memorizing fairy tales, uh, you need to get out more. Um, what you will do is you will construct that story right in front of them. You have the pieces in your mind, you know roughly how it goes, but the story you tell, you will literally construct on the spot. Now when you do that, if somebody records and writes down what you've done, there are actually uh, sort of signs that you leave in the text, just due to the way that memory works and oral performance works, that scholars who study these things would be able to look at your uh, version of the Three Little Pigs and say, this has all the signs that this was constructed live in front of an audience. What's interesting, when we take those tools that we use there and we apply them to the Quran using quite sophisticated computer analysis, all of the same features um, turn up. I won't bore you, bore you with all the details. Um, but that allows us to get quite great insight into actually how the Quran was constructed. And there's a lot of very exciting work uh, being done around the world on that right now. But one other thing on the manuscripts, uh, just to add to what the Bill said, one of the things that fascinated me when I first began to study uh, the transmission of the Quran is an incident that takes place just a couple of decades or so, even less than that, after the death of Muhammad. When Muhammad dies in 632 AD, the Muslim community uh, is led by, uh, led at first by a series of rulers called caliphs, uh, close friends or acquaintances or followers of Muhammad. And the third caliph who comes after Muhammad is a gentleman called Uthman. 
And uh, early in his reign, uh, the story is told in the Hadith and the Muslim traditions in, in Islamic early texts uh, that uh, reports came to Uthman of how Muslims are out on the battlefield as the Muslim Empire is beginning to advance up into Syria and, uh, and beyond. One of the generals comes to the uh, caliph, to Uthman, very, very disturbed and says, basically, the problem we have, sir, is that uh, soldiers are disagreeing about how the Quran should be read. They are arguing with each other, fighting with each other, not fighting the enemy, over the Quran. Do something about it. It's your job. Come on, you're the caliph. Sort this out before the Muslim community disintegrates over its arguments around their text. What he does next is fascinating. We read that he sends out to the four corners of the Muslim empire and, uh, and demands that any manuscripts of the Quran that are in existence, either whole copies or partial copies, be sent in to him. He then has a scribe go through those manuscripts and make one authoritative version of the Quran, which is then copied and sent back out again. And all of those manuscripts that are collected together, we read, were burnt. Now the problem with that means, for those of us who study textual criticism, uh, means that, that, that means that we have no way of knowing what those variants were. What were the differences? What were the, thing, what were the soldiers arguing about? We unfortunately can't know that because the manuscripts were destroyed. But one of my colleagues at Oxford University who's uh, devoted his career to studying textual variants in the Quran says that when you look at the transmission history of the Quran, when you map out the manuscripts, when you trace the textual variants through, you can see the legacy of that burning actually there in the records, there in the data. So we can get back pretty early in terms of the Quran, but we can't get right back to the very beginning because of that destruction that took place. I want to put that just another way briefly because that's extremely important. Uh, when I was unaware of these traditions, I used to accuse the Bible. I used to say, look, somebody, who knows who, took the Bible and inserted doctrine into it. And they took out other doctrine. In order for that to happen, someone has to have control of all the biblical manuscripts. And someone has to say, give me all your Bibles, I'm going to edit them, and I'm going to send out the official ones. That never happened in Christian history. It was never possible. No one had that power. We just saw a few moments ago what the situation was like. People couldn't gather. There was no one person in control of Christendom. None of that happened until after the Romans, uh, after the Council of Nicaea, etc. But we have Bibles from before the Council of Nicaea, whole Bibles. So when it comes to Islam, though, there was a very specific time when someone says, give me all the Qurans. He burns them all and sends out some official ones. So if I, as a Muslim, am willing to point and say, ah, your Bible is corrupt, I'm pointing three fingers back at myself because it was a very specific time when the Quran could have been corrupted. And if I say it wasn't, I'm saying that on faith, not based on the textual evidence because all the evidence has been burnt. Mm. Thank you, Neville. Well, we're going to take one uh, last question, and uh, then we'll begin to bring the evening to a close. So uh, make it a good one, guys. What's the last question? How can I have a deep, intimate relationship with God? What is Islam's answer? What is Christianity's answer? Brilliant question. I mean, that's the question, really, you spend an entire book uh, addressing as you explore that. But Nabil, how, how can somebody have that deep, intimate relationship with God? What's the difference between Islam and Christianity in answering that question? This is a more difficult question to answer than it might look at face value because there's so many different expressions of Islam and Christianity. I'm gonna to go to the core. I'm going to refer to, like I said, the Bible and basic Christian tradition. I'm gonna to refer to the Quran and the Hadith and basic Islamic tradition to say what it means. This question seems to have been formulated by a Christian because when it comes to the question of a deep, intimate relationship with God, that's Christian language. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why you're clapping, but let me continue. <laughs> what the Bible says is that God is love. Okay, First John tells us very clearly God is love. The Gospels show us that God is our Father. Jesus, when he taught us to pray, said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're told to treat God as a Father. Okay? We're told to have a relationship with him, to seek him. First Peter tells us, Cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Okay? We're told that's what God is like, over and over and over again in the New Testament. When we turn to the Quran, 
What do we see? Now, I want to qualify this. The Quran does say, he who obeys Allah and repents, Allah is merciful to him. The Quran does say that. And the Quran does offer mercy to Muslims who repent and turn. The Quran says that Allah is gracious and merciful every time a uh, chapter of the Quran starts. It starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. So when a, a Christian says to a Muslim, there's no grace in your religion, they're missing some very important stuff. No, there is some there. But what the Quran does not talk about is a relationship with God. In fact, the Quran says very clearly in chapter 112, Allah is not a father. Allah is not a son. And you might say, Nabil, that talks about biological sonship, etc. Fine. Why not turn to Surah Al-Maidah, chapter 5, verse 18. I tell you this, go to this verse, because it's bright as day. Surah Al-Maidah, chapter, which is chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 18. The Jews and Christians call God Father. He is not their Father. You are but one of His creation. Doesn't He punish you for your sins just like everyone else? Say to them, you are but His creation. Really? So not only does Allah deny being a Father, then He says Jews and Christians call Him Father and that's wrong. They're just creatures of His. That's what the Quran says. Now, do all Muslims believe that? No, I was taught to believe that you know, the love for all, hatred for none. That was the slogan of my sect of Islam. I was taught to believe that Allah loves us. But I'm talking about the Quran now, and I'm talking about the Bible. And I'm talking about the Hadith, and I'm talking about Christian tradition. I'm not talking about modern teaching. I'm talking about the original religion itself. The Quran barely clearly denies that we should have any father-son relationship. In fact, there's nothing at all in the Quran that says you should have a personal relationship with Allah. Twice in the Quran, and this is the common response that I hear used, Muslims will say, Nabi, uh, the, Allah has 99 beautiful names in Islam. One of them is the loving, Al-Wadud. If you actually look at the verses where Al-Wadud is used, it's always in the context of a threat. It's in the context of do this. And if you do do it, Allah is the loving. It's not in the context of God loves you regardless. What does the Bible say? That God loves you and forgives you. In fact, it says, forgive your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Why? So that you can be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, God loves even His enemies. God is willing to suffer and die for you. God is love. There's nothing you can possibly do to remove yourself from the love of God. That's the message of the Bible. What's the message of the Quran? Turn to chapter 60, verse 1. Allah says to Muslims, do not love those Christians. I'm not talking about all Christians, but at least in this context, Allah says, do not love those Christians. You want to love them. I know you want to love them, but they are my enemy. Don't love them. Chapter 60, verse 1 of the Quran. These are very radically different messages. And when it comes to a concept of a deep, intimate relationship with God, that is a very Christian phraseology. That's very Christian in its origin. I'm not saying Muslims, there's, I'm not saying there's no Muslim who pursues a relationship with God. Sure there are. There are many Sufis, for example, who do that. I was told to do that as a Muslim. There are many Muslims who pursue a relationship with God. But I'm telling you, that's not the message of the Quran, and that's not the message of the Hadith. It's the message of the Bible. And it's the message of Christian tradition. So what can we do in order to pursue a deep relationship with God? My first suggestion to you would be to submit. It's a very Islamic term, but that's exactly what I think you should do. Submit to God. And say to Him, God, I want to know you personally. I love you. You are the one who gave me my hands and my feet. You're the one who gave me a mind. Everything that I have in this life is because you gave it to me. And God, because you're my creator, and you're the one who made me, and you're the only one who can ever give this life hope and purpose because this world is going to end, I am going to die, and if there's any hope and any purpose in this life, it comes from you who has the ability to raise me from the dead. So God, I need you. And the beautiful thing about God is that he's been reaching down to us this whole time, and he's ready to receive us. Luke's Gospel tells us that God is like a father who's waiting for the return of his prodigal son. A son who's run away, who squandered the family inheritance, who has dishonored God. God is waiting for his son to come. And no matter how disgraceful it looks, God is ready to run to us just when we turn to him. It's found in the Bible. 
That's who God is, and that's what I suggest we do. Turn to him and ask him to guide us. And when we look to the scriptures, the Christian scriptures, we see that the core of the Christian faith, trust me, I spent years of my life studying this, years further picking up the pieces of my life because I made this decision, and now years walking with this God of love. We see that Jesus died by crucifixion, rose from the dead to prove that he is God. God is willing to suffer for us, out of his love for us. And then he tells us, look, you have everything. Now you go. You want to follow me? I was willing to suffer for people who could do nothing for me. Now you go. Now you go to Africa, where people have Ebola. And help them. Even if you die, don't worry about it. I have given you afterlife with me forever. Don't worry about your life, says Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and 6. I will take care of you. Does your enemy need something to drink? Give it to them. Is your enemy hungry? Give them food. Give them your clothes. If they tell you to walk with them one mile, walk with them too. This is the message of Jesus. And I tell you, if all of us live as self-sacrificially as God himself modeled us to live, this world would be healed. That's the God I suggest you turn to. Thank you very much.